Good morning, everyone. And, you know, um, I think that Margaret teed this up perfectly for us. Uh, the National Climate Assessment came out on Black Friday. What an interesting day to release it to, huh? <laughs> Coincidence. Uh, but I was reading it as I, not all 1,656 pages, but what I could plow through um, on the train coming up here um, yesterday and getting more depressed by the mile. Janie, I'd like to go to you to, to get your opinion. What, what is your take on its projections? Some of what I guess we really did already know. Um, rising uh, sea levels, uh, increasing um, storms of, of greater severity, um, like, like Sandy, and then the, the, the impact that it's going to have on our economy, on our residents' health and, and well-being. Yeah, well, thank you both Margaret and Kathleen for bringing up the National Climate Assessment. As you mentioned, it was released on Black Friday. Clearly, it was released at a time when uh, most people weren't paying attention, so we must be talking about it, and, and I appreciate you raising it. Um, for us in New York City, the National Climate Assessment really confirmed a lot of what we already know. Because you um, have your own panel of scientists that looks at this co constantly, right? That's absolutely right. We um, have a mayorally appointed independent panel of scientists that produce local climate projections every three years around a, a longer range of risks. So um, we get projections on sea level rise, storm surge, intense precipitation, extreme heat, both extreme events and chronic impacts. Um, and uh, this is a panel that's actually required by local law, so it will continue beyond administrations. Um, and uh, and so we have the privilege of working with this information on a regular basis. It's, it's really the foundational information on which our $20 billion resilience program is based. Um, but but as you mentioned, you know, the, the National Climate Assessment confirmed a lot of what we already know. Uh, sea level rise will, um, of course, be a, a major challenge that we in New York City and, and really coastal cities across the country will have to address. Here in New York City, we're planning for about one to two feet of sea level rise by the 2050s. Um, but we also know that we have to address other risks of climate change. Um, extreme heat is actually one of the deadliest disasters that the city faces. Um, we uh, expect um, the days above 90 degrees to triple by the 2100s here in New York City. Um, and intense precipitation is likely to rise 4 to 11 percent by the 2050s. Um, in terms of the uh, impact on the economy, um, you know, Sandy, Hurricane Sandy, which most of you know, um, hit New York City in, in 2012, um, and it caused $19 billion in damages and economic losses here in the city. We know that the same storm later this century would cost $90 billion in damages and economic losses. So, um, you know, we're, we're not waiting for Washington, D.C. to help us. We're uh, uh, leaning forward on these issues, and, and we've been um, implementing a multi-layered resilience approach um, to upgrade our buildings, make our neighborhoods safer, um, make sure that we're protecting and hardening critical services and inf infrastructure, and protecting our 520 miles of, of coastline here in New York City. You know, the report brought up something no one really likes to talk about, and, and that's retreat. It, it said the potential need for millions of people and billions of dollars of coastal infrastructure to be relocated in the future creates challenging legal, financial, and equity issues that have not yet been addressed. I mean, is that even part of the equation? in a city like New York. Well, there will be places where we won't be able to keep the water out, and we have to start thinking about living with water. And after Sandy, there were buyout programs that the federal government, the state government, and the city uh, uh, sponsored in order to, um, to to consider the possibility or provide the option of, of people moving to safer places. We've learned a lot of lessons from those programs, um, and I think that um, you know we'll continue to apply those lessons and and uh, think about strategies for um, making sure people are living in, in, in safe areas. And if I might jump in here. Sure. We have in three neighborhoods in Staten Island and two neighborhoods in Queens that were particularly hard hit by Sandy, engaged in extensive public outreach and have mapped through zoning special coastal risk districts that very, very severely restrict the amount of development that can occur. Because Sandy spoke so clearly and the communities agreed that these were not areas where we would be encouraging growth. You know, Vincent, I mean, it was after Sandy that FEMA redrew the flood maps that it hadn't redrawn in decades, and, and you learned that you had some 400,000 residents in New York City living in the 100-year floodplain. And I think we've seen around the country how 100-year floods, oddly enough, for the 500 or the 1,000-year ones, happen more frequently than every 100 years, as in Ellicott City, Maryland, recently, right? So uh, talk to us about what you're doing specifically to, to address that risk. And so first, uh, just 
to introduce what New York City DEP is, we're primarily the water and sewer utility for New York City. And I think, you know, over the last few decades, we've done a really remarkable job at improving the local waterways, the Hudson River, East River, Jamaica Bay, and that's encouraged more people to move towards the waterfront for both recreation and, and living. And, um, and, and so that just brings challenges for us as to, you know, both servicing them, but protecting them and protecting city infrastructure um, from both surge, sea level rise, and more intense storms. So if I could also note, you mentioned the 400,000 people living within the 1%. To dimension that, that is a population that is the size of the city of Minneapolis. And when we think about what does that look like, there it's not one size fits all because there are the gleaming towers that we see across the river here. That's one building type. There are single family homes where the owners are able to relocate. But we also have very large communities that are lower income communities and where this low-lying 1% floodplain provides an affordable housing resource. And so I raise that just to say that it cannot be one uniform solution, and it has to be a solution that is informed by tremendous outreach to the community, which is what the three of us do every day. And it is so tough in a city like this because you, you're grappling with, you've got 520 miles of shoreline, and you've got aging infrastructure, aging buildings, and, and as you said, so many communities that are very diverse and, and, and ha face different levels of, of risk. And, and also, I think it was interesting what you pointed out, I think the study found this as well, that throughout the country, it does often seem to be the, the less advantaged members of the community who are at greater risk. One of the best tools I think that we have is our comprehensive waterfront plan. The city first adopted the requirement for this plan in 1993, so way before Sandy. Um, it gets updated every 10 years. Our next one is due out in, I believe, 2022. And um, the plan is developed through a waterfront management advisory board that has 16 public members and then a host of city agencies. So we have just kicked off the latest update and this will be an opportunity to take what is already a comprehensive plan, but add two key new features. One is, as Janie mentioned, incorporating the lessons that we've learned post-Sandy. But the second is having an equity lens, which is important to everything that we do in our city, including access to the waterfront and how we protect ourselves from climate change. Janie, on the, that point, back to Sandy, how much does that disaster inform what the city does every day, what you do every day? I mean, is it really uh, that perspective baked into every action you take? Uh, well, certainly we want to take a resilience lens across everything we're doing. And a good example of that is just earlier this week, this year, we released version 2.0 of our climate resilience design guidelines, which take our local projections for intense precipitation, sea level rise, storm surge, and extreme heat, all of these, disaster, these uh, hazards that New York City faces, and actually provide guidance to designers and engineers on how to incorporate those projections into the design and construction of all of the city's capital projects. Um, so that we're not thinking about resilience projects in a silo. We're not just thinking about the flood wall or uh, the, the tidal gate, but rather thinking about how we bring a resilience lens to every investment that we're making. And I might build on that as well. In addition to the design guidelines, right after Sandy, the city adopted emergency zoning regulations um, that allowed people who wanted to rebuild to elevate their buildings and not lose usable space. So if they rose, elevated their buildings to the flood level, they could add those extra feet on top of their buildings. We are now on the verge of starting the public review process for a citywide zoning for resiliency, which takes the lessons that we've learned. Sorry. Which takes the lessons that we've learned and incorporates them into our zoning. And so again, it has just become a fact of life that resiliency, sustainability, and equity inform what we do as a government. So could you talk to us about some specific sure. projects that, that are underway that they, you know, either, either 
are nearing completion or just starting out, just give us an idea of what, ha what you're doing uh, to help specific communities manage this risk. So there's a lot of city infrastructure that's right along the shoreline. And so both lessons from Sandy and the information that we're getting out of Janie's shop, uh, you know, with, with help from other city agencies is doing a lot of things, hardening, um, elevating equipment. We've done a lot of that recently. Uh, we have a lot of, of pumping stations around the city that are close to the shoreline that took direct hits from Sandy. All of that electrical equipment now we're raising above flood levels and we've, we've done a bunch of that. We have about $300 million uh, more work for DEP budgeted, uh, but retreating where necessary. If we have facilities that are due for an upgrade, maybe they're in the wrong location. So those are some of the things we're also looking at. The other thing that we've done is to arm businesses so that they can protect themselves. We recently, from the Department of City Planning, put out a resilient industry report. And what we did is look at different types of businesses and made suggestions for low-cost interventions that they could consider to protect themselves. It was well-received because it wasn't mandatory. It didn't say you had to do this, but it gave examples of what one could do. Janie, how important is it throughout this process to make sure that you are really including the residents of New York, that they have a voice, that they are a part of this process? Because I, I think whether you're recovering from a disaster or, or trying to build in more resilience, uh, what I've found uh, in working with communities around the country on this topic is that people support what they build. And if they don't have a role in building it, they may not support it. Well, I, I think Marisa already mentioned this, but it's absolutely critical to include residents as part of the process. And I think that's, um, we've been talking about the comprehensive waterfront plan. The mayor's strategic plan is actually documented in the one NYC report, which we're actually also in the process of updating now. And it has four visions, resilience, sustainability, equity, and economic growth. So it's a chance to really think about the balance of all of those four uh, lines of work that, that are so critical to the city. But community engagement is absolutely critical to all, all of that being a success. Um, so you have community meetings and people can come in and say, hey, I like this, I don't like that. Certainly. And 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 me even more than meetings, we have charrettes, we have planning uh, processes where community members are absolutely engaged and at the table. This is really a chance for us to reimagine our waterfront and to think about how we are balancing the need to protect our communities with all the other uses that we rely on our waterfront for, whether it's recreation or public access or transportation. And Marisa can certainly speak to this um, as well. Uh, um, but but you know the, 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 it's it's absolutely uh, critical that we're engaging communities and they're they're have, they have a strong voice at the table um, uh, leading the discussion on on what that looks like. I'd weigh in on this by noting that I said we're on the verge of beginning the public review of a comprehensive zoning for resiliency, even before the very formal seven month public review process begins, we've already engaged in over 100 community meetings. We've produced this fabulous map of planning for resiliency that gives an example, that gives examples of different approaches to protecting ourselves. But I think the other thing that Janie mentioned that's so important to highlight is we're focusing on the defensive, the protection. We also need to celebrate the waterfront. Um, we're a city that was built because on our harbor, um, our industry thrived, again, because of our harbor and the connection to the Erie Canal. For years, the waterfront was a working waterfront, which with global changes, turned into, in many instances, an abandoned waterfront. If you look at our city today, we have thriving maritime industries. Look at the west coast of Staten Island. We have industries that are dependent upon having access to the Newtown Creek Canal. But we also have, because zoning that was put in place in 1994, a requirement that any redevelopment that occurs in a residential or commercial zone, except for one and two family houses, has to include access to the waterfront. And as a result of that, we have scintillating new public access points to the waterfront paid for by the private sector. And the city itself has put in place, in the last quarter century, 65 new public parks. And so people think of our waterfront differently. With the advent of the ferry service in all five boroughs, 
we now think of ourselves as a city connected by ribbons of blue, not just by our subways and buses. And this has been a fundamental reorientation of how we think of ourselves as a water city. Mm -hmm. Speaking of New York being a water city, you do have the largest water and sewer system, correct, in the entire country. Yeah. And, and Vincent, as you look at the steps you've taken since Sandy to, to harden it, to make it more resilient, how does New York compare to the rest of the country that maybe hasn't faced a disaster like you did, hasn't had that wake-up call? Right, so we, we've done, you know, a lot of hardening, um, but, but you know, just climate change in general presents a lot of challenges for us. And, you know, we, we typically think about storm surge events, but we're seeing more rainfall, heavier rainfall, we call cloud bursts here uh, locally. And um, our sewer system was designed for certain capacities as we're getting more rainfall, where we're, it, it's harder to drain the primarily paved streets in the city. And so we've been doing a bunch of other things, a lot of investments in new storm sewers. Uh, Mayor de Blasio allocated $1.9 billion of new storm sewers just for Southeast Queens, and we're well underway in that. But we're looking to green, I guess, the, 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 the urban landscape. So we've been doing things like curbside rain gardens, bioswales, um, and, and other types of infrastructure to have the ground actually soak up those uh, heavy rains before they get into the sewer system. I guess what I was asking too, though, is do you <clears throat> speak to your peers about, hey, look, here's what we learned and you need to be getting ready. I just find that when it comes to disaster, often the best evangelists are those who've been through it, the best evangelists for preparation. Yeah, I think there, there, there are a lot of communities uh, through, throughout the country that have woken up uh, to these things. A lot of the challenges, though, are just funding. Um, a lot of infrastructure in many communities are old. Um, they're looking more at their drinking water side lately than, um, you know, some of the storm drainage uh, and collections issues and protecting those assets. So it, funding is certainly a challenge for many municipalities. To your point about um, other cities, it would be odd to go more than two weeks without having a visiting delegation because we're New York City. And so we have delegations of mayors, we have delegations from foreign countries, and um, we view that as part of our responsibility to share our experiences and also to learn from the delegations because we don't have a lock on all knowledge. <laughs> and we Jenny. also have, um, we're actively involved in networks of other cities that are that are um, taking leadership on climate action. So uh, we're actively involved in 100 resilient cities. We also actively participate in the C40 network. Um, on the cloudburst events that Vinny mentioned, uh, we actually have a great partnership with Copenhagen. Uh, Copenhagen experienced a cloudburst event um, and, and came up with some strategies that, that they were in that, 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 that were working for them in Copenhagen. So we sent a delegation out there. They have been here. They are interested in learning from our coastal protection efforts. So we find those exchanges extremely fruitful. Speaking of taking leadership, um, is it difficult? Uh, you, you, I know that the city does do so much, has its own panel of scientists, but when you're trying to move forward on these issues and you have an administration that is trying to dismantle and roll back environmental protections, regulations, does that make, and this question to any of you, does it make your job here harder? Does it hinder you in any way in, in protecting your city? Of course, the assaults on the Clean Water Act perhaps are the most direct, but also on the Clean Air Act. Um, I think what it does is it hardens our resolve. Um, I would say that one of the biggest challenges we face, not directly related to water, is the assault on immigration. We're a city of immigrants. Over 60% of New Yorkers are either immigrants themselves or have at least one parent who's an immigrant. And so I think you've seen the city rise up as a sanctuary city. You've seen the city challenging um, the proposal to put a question on citizenship in the census. Um, and so we're not sort of sitting back and being passive about it. We are aggressively challenging things that we're seeing coming from the federal level with which we disagree. Let's go to questions now. I'm sorry I didn't give you all a heads up to be thinking uh, about what you might want to ask my wonderful panel. And if you want another moment to think, I'll ask another question before we go to you. And we have a question here in the front. If you would, identify yourself, please. Yeah, Wait for the microphone. Thank you. Oh, sure. Hi, um, I'm Albert Golson, Serial in Council. Um, you spoke about, um, you know, for example, cloud bursts and um, you know climate change as far as having you know too much water, etc. Uh, with climate change, you have also the other extreme um, in terms of drought. 
and a couple of cities worldwide have suffered, Laura cities, severe drought situations over an extended period of time, specifically Sao Paulo, Brazil, and in Cape Town. Um, are there any contingency plans or any planning efforts uh, in anticipation that you basically could, here in New York, could run out of water? You know, it's interesting you mentioned that the National Climate Assessment said your reservoir system was really in very good shape here. They <clears throat> excuse me, cited New York as being an area that they didn't see as being a great risk. Unfortunately, where, where I live down closer to D.C., they said we could have issues because the Potomac River levels where we get some of our water, they are expected to drop, so that could become a problem in the future. But would you like to add to what the climate assessment says? Yeah, so, so the assessment for, for <coughs> the Northeast is actually more mm -hmm. rainfall uh, as part of climate change. So, so our reservoirs currently are at 95% capacity. And I think in New York City, we're, we're a little bit different. We're just fortunate that, you know, for the last seven generations now, since 1842, we've built out this network of reservoirs that have a capacity of 580 billion gallons of water. We use a billion gallons a day, so we've, we've got an adequate supply. Mm -hmm. But it's a great question. Thank you. And we have one back here. Hi there, I'm Anthony Curry. I'm a journalist with Reuters Breaking Views. Um, I'm going to make a, a bit of a hyper-local point, and I will confess this uh, kind of affects me, because I live just up the street. But it's about planning, and it involves resilience, and it involves the waterfront and access to it. Um, and it's the Brooklyn Queens Expressway maybe about to collapse. Uh, so the, the promenade down the street from us is probably going to become, instead of being a walkway, it's going to become a, uh, a six-lane highway, quite possibly. Just after the lovely Brooklyn Bridge Park has been completed after 10 years, and it's fantastic, but it strikes me that planning really was missing there. Because the last thing you want to do is spend a great deal of money building this platform for the new highway when you could have used the waterway for a while. And I grant you that th these decisions go way back, but it just strikes me in general without getting too boring for everyone else on a local point. But it worries me that when it comes to resiliency, planning still has to fit in with the regular issues that a city faces. And in this particular instance, it strikes me that New York City failed. Marisa? I'm glad you mentioned Brooklyn Bridge Park. <laughs> it is uh, something that is extremely near and dear to me. Um, I grew up with my grandfather working on a tugboat in New York Harbor on the piers that today are Brooklyn Bridge Park. For most of my life, those piers were open, rotting places for drugs and prostitution. They contributed nothing to the city. And to see that planners had the vision and that government was willing to lead with financing to bring back those peers. They have a financially sustainable model because of development opportunities on the upland portions. Brooklyn Bridge Park is a runaway success, an example of what planning should be. Other boroughs are now saying, please give me my Brooklyn Bridge Park. Um, also, for anyone who hasn't been there, the diversity of the uses of the park, whether kayaking, whether basketball courts, whether passive recreation. A city has many needs and clearly maintaining its infrastructure, in particular its interstate highway system is essential. And I can assure you that the discussions about how the BQE will be reconstructed will take place in public with very, very lively input and input not just from the nearby residents, but also from the park advocates, from the transportation advocates, and from the businesses who are dependent on the BQE to move goods and services around the city. Okay. Any other questions? Oh, right here. Sure. Okay. Hi, Ellen Sabin, Watering Camp Press. I have actually a really uninformed question, so excuse Fire me. Fire away. But <laughs> as someone who lives in Manhattan and um, has experienced sort of pre-Sandy, the oh my God drama of you live near Ninth Avenue, here's what you need to do to protect your building or your townhouse or your whatever. What is the city doing to inform either building owners or townhouse owners or in advance to let them preemptively, not in the middle of drama, but preemptively, being a public health person, um, figure out what they should be doing to not just protect their asset, but also support the infrastructure? Sure. So um, that's a great question. We have a, a, a campaign called Flood Help NY. Um, you can find the um, the website um, if you just Google Flood Help NY. That will provide you with technical assistance and counseling on ways to lower your national flood insurance premiums or just take steps to protect your your home and your belongings. Yeah. Anyone else want to chime in? No. 
All right, um, we may have time for one more, okay, question on this side, and that'll be it. Hi, my name is Millie Hawk Daniel. I'm with PolicyLink, um, and we launched, uh, as, as part of our many projects that we're doing, what we call the Water Equity and Climate Resilience Caucus, which has about 50 members from across the country. And the focus of this caucus is really to make sure that the needs of low-income communities and communities of color are not left out of this conversation. And it has to be included in multiple ways, and I'm curious to hear if, you know, how New York is thinking about this. I live here, our organization is based in Oakland, California, but when you think about the water issues and that are real concerns, the climate issues that are absolutely real concerns, but you also think about the housing concerns and the transportation concerns. And so what is the process for both engaging community and making decisions about so if we have to move people out of public housing, where are we going to move them to? Many of them can barely afford what they're doing. Thank Recognizing you. that we still have to deal with the, with the climate issues. Thank you. All right. Thank you so much for raising that lens because that underlies all that we do. And I'll give you just one very specific example. Um, as I mentioned, we are updating the once every 10 year update of the city's comprehensive waterfront plan. There is a waterfront management advisory board. On that board, among the public members, are members whose focus is advocacy for low-income communities. And that is embedded in all that we do. Any major change um, to our zoning requires a seven-month process that ends up, that requires having meetings in the community at the community board level, another public hearing at the borough level, another public hearing before the city planning commission where any member of the public can come and testify, and similarly a public hearing at the city council. And um, we are a city that is not shy. Our, these public hearings are well attended. They're frequently contentious because communities speak with many different voices. But I firmly believe we end up with better decisions and with a more equitable city because of this robust public process. Thank you all for your wonderful questions. And please join me in thanking my terrific panel, Janie, Vinnie, and Marisa.